Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we shall take up the application of the principles of the objectivist ethics to the science of politics, to the organization of a rational society, to the nature and functions of government, to the relationship between government and the individual. I shall begin by asking you to consider why do men live in society? Why do individuals not retire with their chosen friends to an isolated self-sustaining farm? What are the advantages that men gain from living and dealing with one another? You will often hear it claimed by the preachers of an altruist morality that men need one another and that therefore they must be willing to sacrifice for one another and not live selfishly. Before one can speak about what man does or does not need, it is necessary to define what is meant by the concept need. The concept of need in this context, that is, as applied to a living organism, means that which the organism requires for its survival and well-being. Thus, we can say that man has a need of food. A need by what standard? by the standard of survival. We can say that man has a need of self-esteem, again by the standard of survival. All of man's needs, the needs of his body or of his mind, are determined, of course, by his specific nature. Do men have a need for one another? Yes, under certain specific circumstances and conditions. The exact nature and meaning of this need requires precise identification, however. Let me first point out that under no circumstances could man's need of other men serve as a valid justification for the doctrine of self-sacrifice. In the claim of the altruists, there is an inherent contradiction. Insofar as man needs others, he needs them for selfish purposes. His self-interest is the standard that determines what are his needs. And to assert that his self-interest can require his self-destruction is blatantly absurd. Survival cannot demand self-extinction. Self-sacrifice cannot be a practical necessity of life. Man's life cannot demand the surrender of his life. The achievement of his values cannot necessitate the renunciation of his values. The cost of self-fulfillment cannot be self-immolation. Now let us proceed to analyze in what way living in society can contribute to the survival of an individual. An understanding of this issue is essential in order to arrive at a valid theory of politics. The first great value that men can offer one another is the exchange of knowledge. For a man to achieve a form of life significantly above that of an animal, he requires a complexity of knowledge that he could not discover single-handedly in one lifetime. Man is the one species that has the power to transmit knowledge and to pass it on from generation to generation thus multiplying incalculably the potential of all those men who come after him. And at any given time, in any given society, men who specialize in different fields of knowledge can exchange their discoveries with others, thereby raising the intellectual productivity of all, or of all who care to think. We who live today can, simply by looking around us, observe the consequences of the tremendous intellectual heritage we now possess, and we can appreciate what a distance has been covered since, figuratively speaking, the first man thousands of years ago connected the first thought and learned to communicate it to the men around him. The development of language was, of course, the crucial discovery making possible the transmission of knowledge from man to man and from generation to generation. 
This emphatically does not mean, as you will hear it claimed by some psychologists and sociologists, that it is society that made man human. Such theorists maintain that without society, man is an animal. But apes also live in societies. This has not turned them into human beings. The mere fact of communal living will not endow man with the power to think which is the distinctly human faculty. That potentiality had to exist in man in order for him to be able to profit from dealing with others, to grasp and make use of the knowledge they offered. If this were not so, there would be no way to explain how the first knowledge was discovered. Rational men can raise one another's intellectual and productive potential they can contribute to the efficacy and fruitfulness of one another's thinking, but they cannot convert the non-human into the human. They cannot convert an ape into a man. I might add parenthetically that certain philosophers have done their best and have come remarkably close to turning men into apes. Without minimizing the tremendous advantage that social living can afford, we must not forget that this advantage is possible only because man has the power to reason, to conceptualize, and that he can make use of the knowledge of others only to the extent that he does choose to exercise that faculty. In addition to the exchange of knowledge, men can profit enormously from the division of labor and from the exchange of the products of labor. The details of this process will be taken up in our discussion of economics, but for the moment let me point out that which all of us can readily perceive. By means of the specialization of labor and the exchange of goods and services, a mode of existence is possible to us that clearly would not be possible if we had to work alone on a desert island or a self-sustaining farm producing everything one needed single-handedly, making one's own shoes, growing one's own food, building one's own shelter, and so forth. The properly self-supporting man produces the value equivalent of what he consumes. But if he lives in a trade society, he is able to specialize in a single line of work to grow increasingly efficient and increasingly productive because he specializes, and to exchange the intellectual or physical results of his labor with other productive men in other lines of specialization. But observe that if these are the two crucial advantages which man gains from living in society, his need of the society is not unconditional. It depends on specific conditions being fulfilled. Men can contribute to one another's survival only to the extent that they have something of value to trade, only to the extent that they are rational and productive. For instance, if you lived in a society of mystics, of men who, to put it in an exaggerated form, never thought, never reasoned, never consulted anything but their feelings and revelations, no exchange of knowledge would be possible. Do you need, is your survival enhanced by, men who think? Yes. Do you need, is your survival enhanced by, men who refuse to think? No. They have nothing of value to offer you. By the same principle, you have need of, meaning your survival is enhanced by, men who produce, men who have objective values to offer you in exchange for the things you have produced. But you certainly do not need men who produce nothing. You certainly do not need men who attack you and feed off you as parasites offering no value in exchange for that which they take. Is your survival enhanced by living among Hank Reardons? Yes. Is it enhanced by living among looters, robbers, criminals? 
clearly not. You profit from dealing with producers. You do not profit by dealing with destroyers. You profit from Hank Reardon. You do not profit from Al Capone. Living in society, then, is a value only to the extent that men deal with you by reason and through productive trade. To the extent to which you are surrounded by men who, instead, deal with you by blind emotion, by irrationalism, and by physical force or fraud, your interests are not only not served, they are negated and sacrificed. If your choice is between a desert island and a concentration camp, a desert island is preferable. If your choice is between a self-sustaining farm and a New York City run by an absolute dictator, the self-sustaining farm is preferable. One cannot justify the existence of a slave society on the grounds that we all need one another. No one needs torture, expropriation, and death. So that when one is considering the issue of man's role in society, the thing that must never be forgotten is why man chooses to live in society, what are the advantages of so doing, and at what point those advantages become nullified and negated. Now with this understood, let us proceed. When men enter into social relationships, when they choose to deal with one another, they face a fundamental alternative, to deal with one another by means of reason or by means of force. Reason and force are opposites. Either a man seeks to gain values from others by their voluntary consent, by appealing to their mind, or he seeks to gain values without the voluntary consent of the owners, that is, by coercion or fraud. This alternative, ladies and gentlemen, is the issue at the base of all social relationships and all political systems. Every use of force is the attempt to compel a man to act against his own judgment. If he were willing to take the action voluntarily, force would not be required. It is at the mind that any gun is aimed. The choice to deal with men by persuasion implies that they, like you, must live and act by the judgment of their own mind, that every man is the owner of his own life and person, and that he is not a means to your end as you are not a means to his, that man must properly act in the name of his own self-interest, that this is what his life requires, and you recognize it, and that if you wish to gain a value from other men, you must offer a value in exchange, be it a logical argument, a service, or a material commodity. The choice to deal with men by force implies your rejection of reason as man's means of survival, your confession of intellectual bankruptcy, your admission that you have no values to offer by means of which you could win your victim's voluntary consent, your belief that men are sacrificial animals whose minds, lives, and property are yours to command and loot. When you resort to the use of force to gain the values you desire, it is yourself that you reduce to the state of an animal. You declare that you are a wild beast who is no longer to be treated or regarded as a rational being. This leads us to a very important statement in Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged, from which I now quote. So long as men desire to live together, no man may initiate 
Do you hear me? No man may start the use of physical force against others. To interpose the threat of physical destruction between a man and his perception of reality is to negate and paralyze his means of survival. To force him to act against his own judgment is like forcing him to act against his own sight. Whoever, to whatever purpose or extent, initiates the use of force is a killer acting on the premise of death in a manner wider than murder the premise of destroying man's capacity to live. To force a man to drop his own mind and to accept your will as a substitute, with a gun in place of a syllogism, with terror in place of proof, and death as the final argument, is to attempt to exist in defiance of reality. Reality demands of man that he act for his own rational interest. Your gun demands of him that he act against it. Reality threatens man with death if he does not act on his rational judgment. You threaten him with death if he does. You place him into a world where the price of his life is the surrender of all the virtues required by life. And death by a process of gradual destruction is all that you and your system achieve when death is made to be the ruling power, the winning argument, in a society of men." Unquote. This is the most basic principle at the root of the objectivist political theory. No man or group of men may initiate the use of force against others. No man or group of men may seek to gain values from others by the initiation of physical force. There is only one circumstance under which the use of force is morally permissible, as retaliation against the person or persons who initiated its use. To start the use of force is evil. To protect oneself against it is not. This is the principle that differentiates murder from self-defense. This distinction is crucial and must be clearly understood. When a man picks up a gun, he announces that he cannot be dealt with by reason. If his victims answer him by force, they merely take him at his word and treat him as he has asked. The man who initiates the use of force does so in order to gain a value. But when a man uses force in retaliation or self-defense, his motive is not to gain a value, but to keep a value that is rightfully his. A rational man does not seek rewards by means of the evil, but neither does he willingly surrender his values to evil. The man who wishes to survive by means of force seeks to live by a double standard. He necessarily is counting on the existence of men who live not by force but by production, men who will create that which he intends to loot. If there were no people who function by reason, there would be nothing for the men of force to expropriate. Force is only a tool of destruction. It is not a tool of creation. Force can negate, but it cannot achieve. It can forbid thought, but it cannot replace it. If there is one infallible test of self-contempt, it is a person's willingness to live under force. His willingness to accept as a moral principle that others have the right to dictate his thoughts and his actions, his willingness to submit his mind and his life to the arbitrary power of a gun. The man who submits to force when he has no choice is not immoral, provided he identifies his plight as evil. But 
the man who considers it moral, considers it right that others should force him, deserves what he gets. And in the world of today, he is getting it. A social or political system is a code of principles that men observe in order to live together. The political expression of the principle that no man may initiate the use of force against other human beings is the concept of rights. Observe that the question of rights would not arise on a desert island. Such a question as, does man have the right to his life his freedom and his property, would not and could not arise if there were no other human beings potentially capable of depriving him of these possessions. It is for this reason that Miss Rand defines a right as a moral principle defining man's freedom of action in a social context. Observe that the word right itself is a moral term. In political usage, it pertains to a sanction for certain actions. But it has a wider moral usage, as when we speak of things as right or wrong. Man's basic right, the right from which all other rights derive, is the right to life. This means the right to act in the manner which man's life requires, the right to think and to translate one's thought into action. Why does man possess this right? Because it is a necessity of survival. Quoting Galt's speech, quote, Rights are conditions of existence required by man's nature for man's proper survival. If man is to live on earth, it is right for him to use his mind. It is right to act on his own free judgment. It is right to work for his values and to keep the product of his work. If life on earth is his purpose, he has a right to live as a rational being. Nature forbids him the irrational. Any group, any gang, any nation that attempts to negate man's rights is wrong, which means is evil, which means is anti-life. It is not thus that rights traditionally have been conceived. Insofar as rights have been defended in the past, they have been upheld usually to be a gift either from God or else a gift from society. It has been argued that since man's life belongs to God, other men must not harm him or enslave him. I do not have to tell you what is wrong with such an argument. To tie rights to God is to build one's entire political philosophy on an arbitrary mystical base, a base that no man of reason will accept. To tie rights to mysticism is to declare that there is no rational justification for them, no rational reason why men should not murder and enslave one another. A political system that has nothing better to offer as sanction for its precepts than the authority of a supernatural ghost is doomed from the start. To claim that man's rights are a gift from society is to assert that man exists not by right, but by permission. Rights are a moral concept. Man possesses them by his nature as man, or he does not possess them at all. That which society gives, society can take away. A permission can be revoked. If your life and freedom are a gift from society, this means that you are the property of society. Again, quoting Galt, quote, The source of rights is not divine law or congressional law, but the law of identity. A is A and man is man. Rights are conditions of existence required by man's nature for his proper survival. Close quote. All of man's other rights, the right of liberty, of property, of the pursuit of happiness, 
are contained in, implied, and necessitated by the right of life. The right to life means the right to think and to act on one's own judgment, which is the right of liberty. It means the right to work for the achievement of one's values and to keep the results, which is the right of property. It means the right to live for one's own sake, to choose and to work for one's own selfish goals, which is the right to the pursuit of happiness. The rights of life, liberty, property, and happiness are logically indivisible. To affirm any of these rights is to affirm them all. To negate, to deny any of these rights is to negate or deny them all. I want to point out that without the right of property, no other rights are possible. The right of property is the right to the use and disposal of that which one has produced. If one is not free to use that which one has produced, one does not possess the right of liberty. If one is not free to make the products of one's work serve one's chosen goals, one does not possess the right to the pursuit of happiness. And since man is not a ghost who exists in some non-material manner, if one is not free to keep and to consume the products of one's work, one does not possess the right of life. The concept of rights, and this is very important to understand, the concept of rights pertains to action. The right of life does not mean that somebody owes it to you to keep you alive. It does not mean that if you starve to death because you refuse to work, your right to live has been violated. The right of life means your right to take the actions which your survival requires free from coercion and interference by other men. It means that you have the right to achieve and maintain your life and that no one has the right to deprive you of your life. Similarly, the right of property does not mean that someone owes you property. It means your right to keep and use that which you have produced. Man's rights are inalienable, which means they are his by nature and by objective moral principle. A society's choice is not whether or not it will grant man's rights, but only whether or not it will choose to acknowledge that he possesses them. Rights can be violated, but they cannot be destroyed. If you murder a man, you do not alienate his right to life. The right is with him. You are wrong. You can take away a man's life, but you cannot take away his right to life. Remember that rights are a moral concept and that moral issues are always a matter of choice. An individual or a government is factually free to refuse to recognize man's rights and to function on the policy of a criminal. But they are not free to escape the consequences. If they pursue a course that is anti-life, death and destruction is all they will achieve, as they are achieving it in most of the world today. The practical form in which one acknowledges the rights of others in action is the commitment to deal with them only by their voluntary consent. There is only one way in which rights can be violated by the use of physical force. Fraud is an indirect form of force. Both consist of obtaining from a man that which he is not willing to give voluntarily. In a free society, you may do whatever you wish, provided you do not violate the rights of other men. This, let me stress, is not a limitation on your freedom. If men do not possess rights, you can make no moral claim to the right of freedom. If they do possess rights, you cannot claim that your rights consist of violating the rights of another. You cannot claim the right to a contradiction. 
The concept of rights, I submit, must lie at the foundation of any moral society. The alternative is a society of criminals and dictators. To reject the concept of rights is to reject the morality of life from which they are derived and to function implicitly on the morality of death. The proof of this statement can be found in any daily newspaper. You will see there the consequences of rejecting rights written in blood across most of the continents of the world. A concentration camp is a monument to the belief that the good of the collective, of the state, or of society supersedes the rights of the individual. And this leads us to the issue of what is government and what is the relationship of government to the individual. A government is a social agency that performs the task of formulating and enforcing the laws of a country. A country in this context is a geographical territory inhabited by men who observe a common code of laws administered by a single government. A law, in this context, is a rule of action pertaining to the relationships of men inhabiting the same country. Exclusive jurisdiction over a geographical territory is a primary attribute of a government. A tribe of nomads that has no fixed habitation, such as the gypsies, may have tribal rulers, but these do not constitute a government. A group of people who share certain principles or beliefs, but are separated in various parts of the world, such as the Catholic Church, may have a central agency that prescribes to them certain rules of action, but this is not a government. The gypsies, or the Catholics, or any other private organization of men, have to abide by the public laws of whatever country they live in. The distinguishing attributes of a government are a. Exclusive jurisdiction over a geographical territory, where its laws apply to all inhabitants, and b. A monopoly on the use of physical force within that territory. For instance, if the rulers of a gypsy tribe decided to punish some member who had broken their laws by executing him, the laws of the United States would not permit it. Such rulers would be arrested and tried for murder. Or if they decided to punish him by locking him in a private jail of their own, they would not be able to enforce their verdict in that the prisoner could escape and appeal to the United States government, which would protect him. In any country and under any political system, the right to enforce its laws by the actual use of physical force belongs exclusively to the government. This is the most important difference between a government and a private organization. Why do men need a government? The willingness to subscribe to a common set of rules or a common set of principles is a precondition of any association of human beings. If men choose to live together and or to deal with one another, they have to agree to observe certain rules of conduct or no action, cooperation, or dealings of any kind will be possible among them. Before a man can deal with others, he has to know what he may or may not do to them, and what they may or may not do to him. There is no other way for men to live or deal with one another safely and effectively. Let's take a few simple examples. Suppose that a group of men agree on a common set of rules and start on a common undertaking, but come to a disagreement on some specific point. Now their only recourse in such case is to appeal to an arbiter, an umpire, a judge, 
and to abide by his decision, if they wish to go on with their undertaking. If they can find no common principle by which to choose a judge or reconcile their differences, and assuming there is no question of a government being involved, they have to resort to physical force, to fight one another till one side or both sides are destroyed. There is no other means to settle disputes. Or again, suppose that one man in such a group decides to act on his arbitrary whim to break the common agreement, seize the property of others, and escape. Again, the others have to resort to force. They have to organize a common defense. They have to pursue him, reclaim their property, and make it impossible for him to injure them in the future. Again, assuming there is no government involved. Since men cannot survive by means of brute force, since they cannot produce nor prosper nor plan a step if their plans are at the mercy of brute force unleashed against them by anyone's personal or arbitrary whim, their need to live under a rule of law is the reason why they need a government. A rule of law is a rule by objective principles, which are understood in advance, observed by all, and enforced on lawbreakers when necessary. It may sound ironic when one considers the extent to which most governments in history have inverted, perverted, and corrupted their function. But men need a government for the purpose of protecting them from physical force and arbitrary whim, and of upholding objective principles of proper action. What principles of action are proper for men is a question to be answered by the science of morality. This is the reason why every political theory is based on a moral theory, and every form of government is based on some moral code accepted by the citizens of a country, explicitly or implicitly, by conscious choice or by tradition or by default. If throughout history most governments have acted on principles diametrically opposed to their proper function and their only moral justification, if, instead of protecting men from physical force and arbitrary whim, governments have been the initiators of physical force and arbitrary whim, if, instead of acting as men's defenders, governments have acted as men's oppressors, look for the cause of it in the kind of moralities that men have accepted. An inverted morality, a morality which penalizes the good and rewards the evil, will result in inverted actions and inverted human institutions. A non-objective morality will result in non-objective laws. A morality that regards men as sacrificial animals will result in a government whose purpose is to enforce the sacrificing. Observe that even the worst, the most tyrannical, and the most brutal governments have always had to maintain the pretense of some sort of moral sanction for their tyranny. The rulers of primitive cultures have had to have the sanction of religion in order to give their subjects a moral reason for obeying their edicts, at a time when morality was the exclusive monopoly of religion. Thus, the pharaohs of Egypt were considered to be gods, supernatural beings destined to rule plain mortals. The absolute monarchs of the post-Renaissance period in Europe had to have the mystical sanction of the doctrine of the divine right of kings. The Soviet dictators spent an incalculable amount of time, money, and effort on propaganda, assuring their victims that their dictatorship is sanctioned by the historically preordained mission of the proletariat and that they, the dictators, are merely the proletariat's humble servants. The Nazi dictators did the same, with the sole difference that the historically preordained mission was changed to the biologically preordained mission of the Aryan race, which Hitler was ordered to serve by personal message from the god Wotan. No matter to what grotesquely irrational nonsense a gangster government has to resort in order to justify itself, the significant fact is that no government has ever been able to use brute force as its own justification. 
Men cannot be enslaved merely by physical force, at least not for long. They have to be disarmed by means of a corrupt morality, by means of their vague, unverbalized, unidentified sense that there is some reason why they need to live under some sort of law and order. Now, as we have discussed in preceding lectures, the fundamental difference among moral codes rests on a single issue which may be summarized in this way. Is it a morality of life or of death? Does it reflect and proceed from the recognition of man's right to exist, or does it implicitly or explicitly deny that right? Now, the same difference applies to all political theories, since all of them are based on one kind of morality or another. The fundamental principle of the root of any political theory, the principle which determines its entire content, is its answer to a single question. Does man possess inalienable individual rights, or does he not? The rest is merely a difference of details, names, tags, slogans, and victims. It is a crucial difference, morally, politically, and practically, whether men live or die. It makes no difference whatever who claims the right to kill them. It is a crucial difference whether men are free or enslaved. It makes no difference whatever who claims the right to enslave them. And in spite of all the volumes of endless verbiage written by the various theorists of political slavery, the results of their allegedly different theories have been totally alike in practice. In all of history, there have been only three distinct political theories, if one considers them not in terms of superficial differences, but in terms of their essential fundamental principle. And I will call these three theories anarchism, statism, and constitutionalism, or again, no government, unlimited government, government limited by individual rights. Now, anarchism, strictly speaking, is not a political theory, but a rejection of political theory. Anarchism claims that men need no government, no political system and that any man should be free to do anything he pleases in relation to other men. Although most advocates of anarchism would deny it, since most of them have professed altruism, the logical base of their political theory is the morality of hedonism, the doctrine that there are no objective moral standards, and that a man's pleasure, his wishes, feelings, desires, or whims, is the only standard of value in action. Statism includes all the political theories which claim that man has no rights, that the state holds absolute power and may do anything it pleases. All statist theories rest on the collectivist altruist principle, on the doctrine that man's life belongs to others, to some authority higher than himself, which is either God or society, and that whoever is the representative of God or of society may dispose of a man's life in any way he chooses for the sake, benefit, and welfare of that higher authority. Thus, in a statist theory, the power of the government is unlimited. There are no individual rights to oppose or restrict it. The government is absolute, omnipotent, totalitarian. The variants of the statist political theory are monarchism, socialism, communism, fascism, Nazism, and democracy. Don't be surprised by this last. The word democracy has been so misused today that, like the word liberal, it has lost all meaning and is now a rubber term which can mean anything to anyone and therefore is no longer a part of articulate communicable language. That which can mean anything means nothing. But in its original use, in political theory, Democracy meant unlimited majority rule and was the name of a political theory which claimed that man has no individual rights, that the people, by a majority vote, may do anything it pleases, and that anything done by a majority is right because it is done by a majority, numbers being the only standard of right or wrong. Democracy is simply mob rule and the best example of it in practice is a lynching mob. 
Historically, democracy could be practiced only in small communities and was practiced in the city-states of ancient Greece, where the people, or those who had the privileges of full citizenship, could get together at a meeting and vote on various issues without the intermediary of elected representatives. A classic example of democracy in action is the death of Socrates. As you may recall, Socrates was sentenced to death by a vote of his fellow Athenians, who considered him dangerous to the morals of the youth of Athens. And although he had an opportunity to escape, he refused to do so, stating that his fellow citizens were wrong in their judgment, but that he recognized their right to dispose of his life if they so voted. This is the moral and political meaning of democracy. The United States, of course, is a constitutional republic, and this brings us to the third political theory, which, to coin the term, in effect, I will call constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is the political theory that holds that man has inalienable individual rights which may not be violated by others that the only purpose of a government is to protect individual rights, man's individual rights, that the power of government is limited by these rights, which the government may not suspend, infringe, break, or violate, that the government as such has no intrinsic power, that the only power it possesses is delegated to it by the citizens of the country and therefore is strictly limited, defined, and specified by a constitution, which authorizes the government to act as an agent of the citizens, not as a ruler, and only in specific issues outside of which the government has no power and may not act at all. In a state of society, the citizens may do only that which the government permits them to do while the government has unlimited freedom of action. In a constitutionalist society, the government may do only that which the Constitution permits it to do, while the citizens have unlimited freedom of action within the sphere of their own individual rights. Only if and when any citizens attempt to violate the rights of others does the government take action against the violators in its proper capacity of protector of individual rights. Thus, the Constitution please note this, is not a document that limits the rights of man, but a document that limits the power of the government and of society over man. This, of course, was the political theory on which the United States of America was built, and this was the principle of the American Constitution. But the historical and philosophical paradox and tragedy involved was this. The political theory of America was based on a morality that did not yet exist, on a morality of life and of man's right to live, which had never been formulated into a moral code nor explicitly accepted by anyone. It was an implicit morality. It was the code by which all honest and rational men had always lived in practice, and the founding fathers of America accepted it implicitly and based their political theory of individual rights upon it. But that which men do not know or accept explicitly and consciously is not in their full control. This is the reason why the United States of America embodies a fundamental conflict from the start a conflict which has been undermining it throughout its history and which has now reached its climax. The conflict between America's political structure and the collectivist altruist morality. One is incompatible with the other. One or the other has to go. If America is to preserve and reestablish its freedom, it is the collectivist altruist morality that it has to reject. The United States, as I have said, is not a democracy but a republic. The difference between the two political forms is as follows. A democracy is a system of unlimited majority rule. A constitutional republic is a system in which the power of the government is limited by the inalienable rights of the individual, and the government may make only such laws as do not violate these rights. 
The confusion of terms and definitions in political theory is worse, perhaps, than in any other science, such that people use words with dozens of different meanings, no one making clear exactly what he is talking about. So it's very important that we be clear as to the exact meaning of terms. For example, when I call a free political system constitutionalism, I mean a system in which a constitution limits the power of the government. I do not mean a system in which some document is called a constitution but is not implemented, enforced, or observed. There is no relation to the actual political administration of a country and exists only as a showpiece to help the visiting evaders to evade some more. Such, for instance, as the scrap of paper called the Constitution of the Soviet Union. Today, most dictatorships and semi-dictatorships parade some such scrap of paper. But it's not formal tags or the corruption of language that we are concerned with, but factual reality. To be a constitution, a political document has to be implemented. The political institutions of the country have to be legally set up in such a manner that no part of the government can usurp power or take action contrary to the Constitution. All political systems in history have been mixtures of contradictory elements and contradictory labels. England, for instance, was closer to a constitutional republic than any other country of Europe. Yet formally, England is a monarchy and has no written constitution. Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany were called republics. So tags and labels will tell us nothing about the political reality of a country. The American Constitution came closer to creating a perfect political system than anything that has ever existed in history. But it was not without flaws and contradictions, and if you study the process by which collectivists gradually have been undermining it, you will see that they were able to crawl in through the cracks of such contradictions as the Constitution did possess, such as the eminent domain clause, the interstate commerce clause, or the phrase general welfare used where and as it is. The political theory of objectivism agrees in essence with the basic principles of the original Constitution of the United States, omitting its contradictions. In a proper constitutional republic of limited government, the Constitution defines a basic code of objective moral and legal principles and sets up the structure of the government for its enforcement, leaving no legal possibility for any official or agency to usurp any form of constitutional power. Thus, the function of the government is that of political administrator or policeman, charged with the task of applying the principles of the Constitution to the specific issues and cases that come under its jurisdiction. The government formulates the laws necessary to translate these principles into practice. Please take note of the exact meaning of the word formulates. It means that the government may pass laws only for the practical application of constitutional principles, but may not depart from these principles nor legislate at its arbitrary discretion. For instance, the right of property is an inalienable constitutional right. The concrete application of this right involves an enormous complexity of issues, including all issues of contracts, patents, copyrights, etc. The task of the government is to formulate the laws applicable to these issues which would protect the property rights of all those involved. What the government may not do is pass laws which would sacrifice the property rights of some men for the benefit of others or laws which would violate all property rights. The basic definition of the proper functions of government are given by Miss Rand in Galt's speech, from which I quote, quote, The only proper purpose of a government is to protect man's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence. A proper government is only a policeman acting as an agency of man's self-defense and as such may resort to force only against those who start the use of force. The only proper functions of a government are the police to protect you from criminals, the army to protect you from foreign invaders, and the courts to protect your property and contracts from breach or fraud by others. 
to settle disputes by rational rules according to objective law, unquote. All the complexities of political issues, of what is legally right or wrong, of what is a public or a private matter, of how to reconcile the rights of millions of individuals, which may appear to clash at times, are reducible to this single simple principle. The government may make no laws which initiate the use of physical force against anyone. No matter how complex any specific issue may appear, if this principle is held as an absolute, the proper legal solution can be found to achieve just, equitable, objective, rational legislation. But what a proper government does not permit itself is a policy which amounts to, well, in case of difficulties, let's force somebody. That is not a solution. The purpose of a proper government is to eliminate the use of physical force among men by establishing a system of objective laws and to act as an objective judge in settling without violence the kind of disputes that can arise even among men of full rationality and virtue. It is precisely in order to avoid gang warfare that rational men delegate to a government the task of using force as retaliation against criminals. A government's use of force is subject to and restricted by severely specific rules. A government cannot seize, arrest, or condemn a man arbitrarily. It has to act in accordance with a strictly defined procedure. It has to abide by the laws of evidence, of proof, of defined punishments for defined crimes. A proper government is the agency by means of which the use of force is placed under objective law, under objective control, and is not left open to the whim of any individual who may wish to use it. Rational men lose nothing in delegating to a proper government the right to use force in retaliation and they gain the organized protection of an entire society to defend them against criminals. Now, in a society such as I have described, there is, of course, a complete separation of state and economics. That is to say, implicit in the political theory we have been discussing is the political-economic theory of laissez-faire capitalism. How does such a socio-economic system work in practice? That is the subject we will turn to in our next lecture. Thank you.